Hi, everyone, and welcome to this video that accompanies section 21.4 of the book Algorithms Illuminated, part four. This section is a brief introduction into one type of semi-reliable magic box known as a mixed integer programming or MIP solver. So lots of discrete optimization problems, including pretty much everything that we've seen in this book series, can be cast as a special case of a very general problem known as mixed integer programming. Now, programming here, the word has the same anachronistic uh, use that it did when we discussed dynamic programming or that you hear in television programming. So programming here refers to planning, not to coding, as you might expect uh, in the modern day. In any case, whenever you have an NP-hard optimization problem that lends itself naturally to a formulation uh, as a mixed integer program, throwing a MIP solver at it is probably worth a shot. Let's get an initial feel for how this might work by revisiting an old friend, the knapsack problem. So let me remind you the definition of the knapsack problem, which we've discussed a few times in the past. Uh, so the input comprises two n plus one positive integers. So there are n items, each of which has a value and a size. And then the last of the numbers, capital C, is a knapsack capacity. So for example, uh, here's an example with five items and a knapsack capacity of 10. The goal is to choose a subset of the items. You would like the total value of those items to be as high as possible. Uh, but the constraint is that the sum of the sizes of those items should be at most of the knapsack capacity. The problem specification spells out three things. The decisions to be made, the constraints that have to be respected, and the objective function, which is to be optimized. The decisions, well, we need to make a binary decision for each of the n items. For each item i, we need to decide whether it's going to be included in the knapsack in our subset or not. A very convenient way to numerically encode binary decisions is as 0, 1 variables. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to use xi to denote 1 if i is included in the subset and 0 if i is excluded from the subset. Second, the constraints. Actually, in the knapsack problem, there's only the one constraint saying the sum of the chosen items sizes should be at most capital C. What I want to notice here is that that constraint is actually very easy to express in arithmetic in terms of these decision variables, these XIs that we've introduced, right? Because an item I is going to contribute its size S sub I to the overall size if it's, if it's included, and it will contribute zero to the overall size if it's not included. So in other words, we can express the total size of the chosen items as a simple sum. So we sum over the items, and then a given item contributes sj times xj. Notice that's going to be 0 if xj is 0, if the item is excluded, and it's going to be sj, the size of item j, if j is included. The final part of the problem specification is what it is we want. What is the objective function? And that's just maximizing the total value of the chosen items. And just like the total size was easy to express as a sum in terms of the xj's, so is the total value. It's just exactly the same sum except with the sj's replaced by the vj's. So guess what? You just saw your first mixed integer program, your first MIP. To make sure this is all crystal clear, let me literally spell out what the mixed integer program is for the case of this uh, five item example on the right part of the slide. So let me write the objective fu function first. So remember, we want to maximize. We want to maximize the total value. And the total value can be expressed as a sum of the decision variables, the xj's, each multiplied by the value of the corresponding item. So the first item had value 6. So that gives us a 6x1 as the first term, right? The item contributes 6 to the value if it's included, 0 if it's not included. Uh, second item has value 2. So excuse me, value 5. So it, we get a 5x2. Third item has value four, fourth item has value three, and the fifth item has value two. So that's gonna be the objective function. So for a given setting of the xj's to zero or one, this just encodes the total value of the chosen items. Then we have the constraints. So now we wanna say that the total, uh, the sum of all of the sizes of the included items is at most the knapsack capacity. So the first item, remember it has a size of 5, so we're going to have an 5x1 here. It contributes 5 to the size if it's included, 0 to the size if it's not. And then similarly, second item has size 4, third item has size 3, second, fourth item has size 2, and uh, last item has size 1. Uh, 
And then finally, let's just record what, what are these XJs. They are zero or one. And, our, and the zero or one is meant to indicate whether the item is excluded or included in the, in the final subset. And this, simple as it is, this is exactly the sort of description that can be fed directly into a magic box known as a mixed integer programming or a MIP solver. So for example, if we wanted to know the answer to this five item instance that we have on this slide, uh, we could use a leading commercial MIP solver like Garobi Optimizer would be one example. And if we wanted to do that, you would literally just invoke the solver with the following input file, which you'll notice is literally what we just wrote down on the previous slide in math. You just translate to a text file, you feed it into Garobi Optimizer, and in the blink of an eye, it will tell you the optimal solution, uh, which in this case turns out to be to setting x1 equals 0, the rest of the xj is equal to 1. So you exclude the first item, you take the other four. So this naturally was just a toy example, just five items. Usually when you're using a MIP solver, you're solving instances that are bigger. And for larger instances, you're not going to want to type up this input file by hand. You're going to either want to write a program that generates the input file automatically uh, or alternatively just interacts directly with the solver's API. Let's move on to discussing mixed integer programs more generally, beyond just the knapsack problem. Um, although I probably owe you a couple of words of explanation before that. First, you might be wondering, you know, what is the mixed? What's up with the M in MIP? Uh, and mixed refers to the fact that uh, the solvers we're discussing accommodate a mixture of different types of decision variables. So we've only used a binary one so far, zero or one. Uh, more generally, they can handle, uh, they can use decision variables that can take on integer values within some range, or even real valued variables within some range. So because you can mix real valued and integer valued variables, that's why they're called mixed integer programs. I should also warn you that what I'm calling MIPS are sometimes called other things. MIPS is definitely a common terminology, uh, but some authors will call these instead integer linear programs, ILPs, uh, to emphasize the linear aspect, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then some authors just say integer programs, IPs, and leave off the mix. There's also a really interesting special case of a mixed integer program, which is the special case where there are no integer valued or zero one decision variables where all the decision variables are real value. So that special type of MIP is known as a linear program or an LP. State-of-the-art solvers work really, really well on linear programs. In fact, anytime you use a solver to solve a mixed integer program, under the hood, the solver is probably solving thousands of linear programs to help it along. Not coincidentally, it turns out uh, the linear programming problem is polynomial time solvable, while general mixed integer programming is NP hard. So that's a still very powerful and expressive, but quite tractable special case of mixed integer programs. Linear programs, the case where all of the decision variables are real valued. So how do you specify a MIP in general? Well, it's really just those same three ingredients that we discussed. You have to identify your decision variables, which decisions are getting made. You have to say what your constraints are, and you have to say what you want. What's your objective function? The one really important restriction is that both the constraints and the objective function should be linear functions of the decision variables. So what does it mean to say that uh, the constraints and objective function are linear in the decision variables? Well, let's go back and look at our knapsack uh, integer program. What you'll notice is that in both the objective function and in the constraints, you know, we have taken some of the decision variables and scaled them by a constant, you know, like six or five or four. And we've also added up the decision variables uh, together, but we haven't done anything else. And so that's exactly what linear means. So for example, you would not be allowed to have an expression like xj squared, that would be nonlinear. You couldn't have xj times xk, that would be nonlinear. You couldn't have like one divided by xj, one over xj, also nonlinear. E to the xj, log of xj, etc. None of those are allowed to show up uh, in a mixed integer program. So both the constraints and the objective function need to be expressible as basically sums over decision variables scaled by constant factors. It is true that the latest and greatest MIP solvers can also accommodate limited types of nonlinearity, like certain quadratic terms, uh, but they typically run much faster when you have just linear constraints and objective functions, and that's what we'll focus on here. So now I can formally define for you the mixed integer programming problem. Basically, you're given a description of a MIP, and your job is to just find the best solution subject to the constraints.
So the objective function being a linear function, right? All you can do is basically choose what to scale the different decision variables by. So the input just consists of the coefficients of the linear function. So coefficient CJ for each of the decision variables XJ. Similarly for each constraint, and unlike the knapsack problem, you're perfectly welcome to have more than one constraint in a mixed integer program. So for each of the M constraints, again, it needs to be linear. So you need to specify uh, the coefficients. You also need to specify a right-hand side for the constraint. So for example, in the knapsack problem, uh, the CIs become the item values. Remember, those were the coefficients in the objective function. Uh, we only had one constraint, so M was equal to one, and the coefficients for that constraint were equal to the item sizes. Remember, that was the left-hand side of the constraint, the inequality. Whereas meanwhile, uh, the B, the right-hand side, is just the knapsack capacity, uh, capital C. So a generic mixed integer program, this is what you get. You're told what the decision variables are and which values they're allow allowed to uh, take on. You're told a linear objective function value through the coefficients, and then you're told some number m of constraints, again, uh, linear, again, specified via their coefficients. So the responsibility of a, of a MIP algorithm, of a MIP solver, is then just to, to compute an optimal solution to this very general optimization problem. So among all of the allowable ways to assign values to the decision variables, among all the ways that can respect all of the given constraints, you want to find the one with the best objective function value. So if you're trying to maximize an objective, uh, you want the variable assignment that satisfies all the constraints and has as high an objective function value as possible. So even with this linearity restriction in both the constraints and the objective function, uh, it can be embarrassingly easy to express NP-hard optimization problems as mixed integer programs. So we already saw an example of that uh, when we talked about knapsack and wrote this very simple integer program. You know, just to elaborate on the point, you know, imagine we had a harder knapsack problem called a two-dimensional knapsack problem, where now every item J, it has as usual, it has its value, VJ, it has its size, SJ. Suppose it also has a, a third parameter, a weight, WJ. And in addition to the knapsack capacity, capital C, suppose there's now an analogous bound on the total weight, capital W. So the goal now in two-dimensional knapsack, again, you want to maximize the total value of the items that you choose subject to two constraints. First of all, as before, the total size should be at most the knapsack capacity, capital C, but then also the total weight of the chosen item should be at most the weight bound, capital W. Now, you're a graduate of the Algorithms Illuminated Dynamic Programming Bootcamp, and you could knock out a dynamic program for the two-dimensional knapsack problem uh, without that much trouble. But you could not do it as quickly as you could simply add the second constraint to the mixed integer program that we already have. And it's not just the knapsack problem. So many problems that are familiar to you, like for example, maximum weight independence set, the minimum mix band problem, the maximum coverage problem that we talked about, all of those are really quite easy to encode as mixed integer programs. So those are problems that if you want to try to tackle them with a MIP solver, you should go ahead and give it a shot. Mixed integer programs are also the state of the art for tackling uh, the traveling salesman problem if you want to solve it exactly in practice. Although that application of integer programming is quite a bit more sophisticated than the other examples that I mentioned. If you want to learn more about how to apply MIPS to the traveling salesman problem, uh, I suggest you do a web search on the subtor relaxation. Not only can many problems uh, be naturally encoded as a mixed integer program, in fact, many problems can be encoded as a mixed integer program in multiple different ways. And it turns out the choice of formulation can matter a lot. So you can see solver performance very tremendously, even by an order of magnitude or more, depending on which specific formulation you use. That means if uh, your first attempt at tackling a problem using a mixed integer programming solver fails, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the wrong technology. It may just mean you need to experiment with other ways of encoding your problem as a MIP for the solver to have acceptable performance. So now that you're feeling amped up to apply one of these uh, semi-reliable magic boxes, one of these MIP solvers uh, to a problem that you care about, where should you get started? Well, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what the state of the art looks like at the time of this recording, which is in the year uh, 2020. Right now, there's unfortunately a huge gulf in the performance between commercial and non-commercial solvers. So let me give you recommendations separately for each of those two cases. So these days, a majority of experts will tell you that the Garobi Optimizer Solver uh, is the most consistently reliable and robust one out there. If you wanted to choose a runner-up, you'd probably choose either CPLEX, uh, which is actually in some ways a precursor to uh, Garobi Optimizer, uh, or FICO Express. 
So the good news is that if you're associated with a university, if you're a student or your staff at a university, uh, you can obtain free academic licenses for any of these solvers. Uh, it is sort of restricted to research and educational use. So for those of you uh, stuck with non-commercial solvers, if you ask around for recommendations, here's four of the names that you hear reasonably often. Um, it's kind of an alphabet soup of various acronyms. But anyways, so you can start with the SIP solver, SCIP, uh, CBC solver, MIPCL, um, or at a, the GNU project is the, is the GNU linear programming kit, GLPK. The CBC and MIPCL solvers have more liberal licensing agreements than the other two. Uh, the other two are free for non-commercial use only. So another thing you might want to look into if you sort of get serious about these MIP solvers uh, is if you want, you can decouple the tasks of sort of formulating a mixed integer program for your, for your problem. And on the other hand, sort of syntactically describing the formulation you came up with to a particular solver by specifying your mixed integer program in a high-level solver-independent modeling language. Uh, one good example is the Python-based um, CVXPY. So the cool thing, if you do choose to use one of these solver-independent modeling languages, is you can then experiment easily with all of the solvers supported by that language to figure out which one tends to work the best on the types of inputs that you care about. Your high-level specification is just going to get automatically compiled down into whatever format the solver is expecting. So that wraps up what I wanted to tell you about the semi-reliable magic boxes known as MIP solvers. There's one other genre of such boxes I want to tell you about, satisfiability solvers, and that'll be in the next video. I'll see you there.